Right. So this evening, um, we have two individuals that um, have joined the Maui Ocean Center as our environmental team. Um, Robin Knox is our first speaker for this evening, is an environmental professional. Um, Robin Knox is an environmental professional with 30 years experience protecting water quality. She's worked as a professional water protector on projects in 20 states and 7 EPA regions as a consultant to businesses, government, and nonprofit organizations. Um, she offers a broad perspective in water quality and innovative approaches to control pollution. Our second speaker for this evening is Avia Kuhana. <laughs> Maui Ocean, Center, Ocean Center's Environmental Director. Um, Abiyad is an environmental protection fanatic, an engineer, and an entrepreneur. He owns and operates several technology companies in the green tech space. Most recently, he owns his own company um, that develops alternative chemicals in replacement of hazardous chemicals for the sake of the environment. Of course, the environment won, and Abiyad was rewarded with a lot of work, infinite stress, and eternal work. So this evening, Robin and Abiyad will explain the history of Moaia Harbor water quality, sources of pollutants entering the harbor, um, the clean water regulations, and the role of Maui Ocean Center's effluent um, in restoring water quality. In addition, um, our general manager, Tapani Rory, will be coming up and just say a few introductions to um, our team this evening. So without further delay, please welcome the team that will be presenting tonight. Actually, I will not introduce Aviat or Robin, everybody pretty much knows them. Uh, Lily did a wonderful job with that. Uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of background. Uh, I started here in uh, September 2015 as a general manager. Immediately, um, it became uh, evident for me that uh, the water quality was an existential issue for Maui Ocean Center. As you know, we operate under DIPTIS permit. Uh, over the years, we had had few exceedances, uh, which you can find also online, uh, it's a public uh, record. Uh, so to me, this became really number one priority. Of course, corporate expects us to try visitation and uh, all the other normal things that uh, any corporation does. So I'm also responsible for the PL, but uh, really the water quality is very, uh, very important. Uh, it really became a priority uh, for me. Uh, Aviad and Robin, uh, how long have you been with us now? For a year, a little bit over a year, I believe. <coughs> We uh, meet weekly, uh, we have regular conversations. Uh, we've been to see the uh, Department of Health, we have seen different stakeholders. Uh, it never ceases to amaze me, actually, how much synergy we have working together, and it's really amazing to see the level of uh, professionalism, understanding uh, that both of them have about these issues, so both in their own specific areas specifically. and. Uh, to me, it was really important that we have an environmental team here because besides environmental team, uh, you know, it's this is really where the priority has to be for us. Uh, I've talked quite a lot about the community approach. So uh, everything we do here, it really starts with the community. It ends with the community. We are not an entertainment business. I keep repeating this to Lily and everyone else here in, you know, in the park uh, all the time. We really need to be a uh, you know positive community member. To me, the water quality issue has been uh, very important in that sense, and uh, it really became evident uh, fairly fast as we started doing a complete uh, mass flow balance uh, analysis, and we really started breaking the systems down and uh, doing analytics. That uh, wait a minute, this is actually a bigger problem. And this, I believe, you'll get a glimpse of this issue tonight. And uh, I think it's important to see, you know, where the potential solutions are. And just to give you one final anecdote, I really want to give them the maximum time to talk about tonight. When we were ready to go to the Department of Health uh, to present our findings and uh, talk about our permit, need this permit, uh, my instructions to our, uh, you know, environmental team were, Let's go in there, let's find solutions, and let's take solutions to the table for the Department of Health. 
and it actually turns out that nobody really has done this before. They were so impressed by our approach that they actually, at, at the end of the meeting, they said, build together a consortium for the community stakeholders, look at addressing the watershed plan here in Malaya, and we'll give you money. To me, this was really uh, impressive uh, statement coming from the regulators, coming from the uh, people um, you know, who, who really have always sat on the other side of the table, but that's exactly my point. We are all in this together. So I want to part my portion with those words because we all need to work together. We need to find solutions that we can find common ground and figure this thing out because this is a bigger problem because right now Clean Water Act is being ignored and as a result, the marine ocean ecosystem environment is getting damaged because of that fact. So with that, I'll leave it for Robin if you want to take it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So, um, here we are, right on the harbor, talking about the harbor. And I'm going to talk about water quality in the harbor, um, and some of the Clean Water Act regulations, and how things are supposed to work, and how they are working, and then how our um, findings kind of turn all the equations on their head. Um, one of the things about the Clean Water Act is the goals of the act. And the primary goal is fishable, swimmable waters. That the fish should, and aquatic life should be able to live. You should be able to eat the edible species without worrying about contaminants. And you should be able to swim in the water without worrying about getting disease or toxicity from chemicals. Um, and at the time the Clean Water Act was passed, there were actually rivers that were catching on fire from the amount of chemicals um, that were dumped in them. So, here's the simplified chart. <laughs> of, uh, and I actually did take a DOH chart and improve it, and they like this one. Um, so, in the, in the background here, is your watershed. Now, a watershed is not just the part at the top of the mountain where the watershed partnerships work. It's also all the way, Malka to Makai, all the way to the edge of the reef is what the Hawaiians believe. Um, the Ahu Pua'a goes all the way out into the ocean. So there you have all your natural processes, land cover, um, you know, different flows, things like that going on. The transport, water is a conveyance, so it transports materials. Um, and that's one of the things we'll talk about is the masses of materials. So over that natural um, watershed, we have an overlay of things that the Clean Water Act requires a state to do. One is a continuing planning process, and there is a state water quality management plan and a plan uh, called area-wide plans or basin plans that are about sewage treatment. So given some of the most recent news on Maui between cesspools and injection wells, we might want to look back at that document and see what was our plan for sewage treatment. Um, that planning process drives state regulations. And then um, those state regulations include wastewater discharge regulations and water quality standards, and there are federal counterparts of both of those, and the most stringent one applies. There are, um, th those two regulations play into a program where the state is required to do monitoring. They get money from EPA, and they monitor water quality, and they see, does it meet the standard? And the standard is designed to protect those uses, fishable, swimmable. So this is a standard that applies in the water. Treatment standards up here apply at the discharge point. So there's a difference between those two, or at least they're supposed to be. Um, so after they get the, the monitoring data, they do the assessment, and they do what's called the Integrated Water Quality Report. Now, if that uh, report says that the waters are not meeting the standards, they're assumed, if they're not meeting the standards, to be not supporting the uses, and that has to be reported to Congress. And that happens every two years. And that report comes out, it's subject to public review. You can look up your favorite water body and, and see how it's doing and comment to the Department of Health. 
Um, if those water bodies are impaired, then you're supposed to go to what's called a TMDL, a total maximum daily load. And that would be, if you can imagine a pie, the pie is how much pollution could go into a water body, let's say, for instance, the harbor. Um, and that pie has to get divided up. So each holder of an NPDES permit, which would be Maui Ocean Center, the county of Maui has one for stormwater in Kapalui. They may have one soon for the injection well in Lahaina. Um, those permit holders, it's mandatory that whatever piece of the pie that study shows, that has to get enforced in their permit. Now the other sources of pollution, those are called point sources, and the other sources of pollution, non-point sources like stormwater runoff or groundwater that seeps into the water body, those are not under that command and control regulation of permits. Those are regulated voluntarily through watershed planning and um, you know people reducing their pollutant loads without there being a permit requirement. So Maui Ocean Center ends up um, getting a water, if there's a, t if there's a pair of waters, they will get a piece of the pie and that will, that's called a waste load allocation, and that'll be an enforceable limit in their permits. Um, now there's supposed to be a lot of steps here to assess the reality of treatment, the reality of effluent variability, and all kinds of other things. And for non-point source runoff, like I said, that's voluntary. The state has that polluted runoff control and watershed planning, and that's what uh, Tapani was talking about, that they might um, fund some projects. But if you're that NPDES permitter, permittee, you really want to be involved in that TMDL and help do the studies and help make sure it's good science, because you're going to have to comply with the outcome. Now, Mylia Harbor um, and the bay are impaired for different uh, pollutants. You can look it up, mainly nitrogen species and turbidity. Um, so they are in this loop, but the state has not scheduled a TMDL and they have the harbor as low priority for TMDL. I, I think that's really foolish. One, you have a discharger whose permit is dependent on it. Two, the harbor is an economic engine for our tourism industry. And three, the tourism people recently came out with a strategic plan that says water quality is our bread and butter. People come here for the water quality. And they have a goal of wanting to reduce the number of brown water days from stormwater runoff. So that's uh, a quick overview. But what the, uh, because this is all complicated, of course, it takes a lot of money uh, that the state doesn't have. The state um, decided to develop a shortcut here, straight from the water quality standards to the end of pipe permit, and they take a number that's meant to be met in the ocean after mixing, and they're applying it directly at end of pipe. And one of the things that we've determined is there's no feasible treatment to meet those limits. So this is quite a dilemma. And for those limits to be higher than that, um, as you'll see, there's some other things with these other programs that need to happen, not just the NPDES permit. So the bottom line is that DOH isn't accounting for all pollutant sources. They have these programs that are supposed to account for everything and work to control everything, but at the harbor, they're only working on one source, and that's the ocean side. So what's the harbor water quality like? Um, first of all, what are some of the sources going in? There's a picture of the harbor, and if you look at these, uh, well, first of all, Chris Brosia sent us the watershed map, and I'm sorry I didn't have time to get it in here, but it is a huge 51,000 acre watershed, so it's quite large, and um, all of, so it's up here on top of the mountain is where the map that he showed us, but it went further this way than I would have imagined. Um, I knew it went a long way this way because of the drain. This is a highway and there's a drainage system that's picking up all the runoff coming this way and it's bringing it right here to the culvert by the boat ramp, which is, figures prominently in our story here. And you can also see the other sources. We've got um, 
grazing, and there's going to be a big development going in here, Mike Atherton's uh, development at uh, Waikapu. Uh, condos here that have been here for quite a while, and they each have their own sewage treatment plant with injection wells. Um, and those are fairly shallow, less than 100 feet deep, um, and right near the shoreline. So um, we already know from Lahaina that the fresh water from injection wells can surface right at the shoreline because it's buoyant and you're putting it into a saltwater. Um, agriculture, of course, we have legacy groundwater contamination uh, due to the many years of sugarcane activity there. So those are the known sources. When it rains, this is what it looks like. And we have, you know, I have multiple folders on my computer of different rain events that look like this with the tons of mud coming down. But this is nothing like what we saw February 6th. In 1994, uh, Aviad, I want you to come up and tell us about this part. But this is information that came out of the um, EIS for the Ocean Center. But Avia, could you talk a little bit about the circulation? Okay. So when we started that, the idea was to see what we could do to prove that there are different sources into the into the harbor. Um, as you can see, we have runoff. That's what Robin just talked about. Can you go back to the slide before that? And before that? One of the things to note is that this area, the whole egg sugar camp in this area, is known to have ammonium nitrate being used as a fertilizer for many years. Um, and it's still being, it has a low shelf life, this thing you know, stays in the environment for a while, and it's being washed right into here. This is, you can see the sedimentation here. So that's source number one. Now, so this point is, can you go? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so this is the, um, that's the entry point. So it's not only water that comes in, there's a lot of uh, agricultural residue, let's call it. Then, one of the things that, that was very evident is that there is groundwater going in from here. And here there used to be a drain. Maui Ocean Center doesn't exist yet. This is a, a newer map. So this is the drain. And there is some groundwater coming from here. And the EIS data at the time did this, uh, they did some work showing that a little bit of water comes in, more water comes through the groundwater, and it creates this clockwise circulation where it splits off here, a little bit stays in the, in the harbor and some goes out. And what it means is that this becomes a little pool of water. And this is very important to see the next uh, steps. Do you want to take the next one? Good. Right, so one of the things, let's go back for a second, is as you see, when it's going round and round, it's some of that uh, pollutant load or mass of pollution that's coming out with all these different sources um, isn't even going out to the ocean of, of an ocean where it would get more mixing. It's actually going around and round, so it, it can actually concentrate, and the sediments even can become a sink, like a bank for nutrients. So, recognizing the poor condition of the harbor water quality, um, you know, Maui Ocean Center, when they first, they have a flow through seawater system. This is water that's coming straight from the ocean. It's filtered to improve it from the ocean water quality. You know, the turbidity comes down and then it's used in here and then it goes through some treatment filters and ozone and other things and then it goes um, into the harbor. Well, initially, Maui Ocean Center was going to do like most dischargers do. They discharge back to the same body of water that their intakes in. But um, the DOH recognized, you know, this is clean seawater because after the treatments, you know, it's much cleaner than uh, these other sources, as you'll see. And it could actually help reduce pollutant concentrations in the, in the harbor as well as improve that circulation 
because there's 1.2 MGD of flood. So DOH said, uh, Maui Ocean Center, would you be willing to discharge into the harbor instead of to the bay? And so that's what they did, and that actually worked. So this is 1994, Mylai Harbor Nitrate. So the colors um, tell you how concentrated the pollution is. So the reds and purples are high and the greens are lower. Um, and as you can see, there's no green in 1994 when we look at nitrate data. And you know, quite high, near 200 parts per million or more everywhere on the shoreline. In 2017, this is what it looks like. And you can see that um, you know, now the ocean center's here which of the 94, the ocean center wasn't here. So that 1.2 million gallons per day of fresh seawater that's cleaner than the harbor water is actually improving things. So now you see a lot of green, even some light green out here, um, but you still see, hey, something's going on over here where that storm water and groundwater are coming in. Um, yes? Where, where, can you kind of know where does the water come into the ocean? Oh, it's out here in the bay. It's off of our slide out here somewhere. Yeah, there's a pipeline. Thank you for asking. Um, if you look at ammonia, similar pattern, 1994. And what's particularly alarming about this is that, remember I said about fishable, swimmable waters, ammonia is extremely toxic. And it was 30 in the data that we had, which wasn't a lot of data. Um, and 35 is toxic. So. You know, if you looked at the spread of data and got a complete data set, it, that probably was already at toxic levels all the time. So 2017, again, improved, more green. Still got the hot spot over by the boat ramp, though, for a moment. And then um, if you look at, so what's important, and this is a really important principle for pollution control, is when people talk about um, pollution, they usually talk about concentration, like all the numbers on these maps are concentrations. So it's parts per million, or parts per billion is actually what these numbers are. Um, so it's a, a unit of mass, like a microgram, in a volume of water, a liter. So micrograms per liter is parts per billion. So that's a concentration. Another way to measure pollution is pounds per day. And that's the way it's measured when you do pollution control. Because all kinds of games can go on when you start mixing waters of different qualities, and you've heard that saying about, you know, pollution's not the answer to pollution. So we have to not just look at concentration. We have to look at mass. So when we look at those numbers in terms of mass, um, Maui Ocean Center is 2% of the nitrate concentration. Um, Runoff is 29%, and groundwater is 39.5%. Uh, when you look at the volumes of water, however, you see that Maui Ocean Center with the cleaner water is a large volume, and 40%, the groundwater is 43 and the stormwater is 16%. And that, of course, stormwater is episodic. These other ones go on all the time. So that's just kind of, you know, the picture. Maui Ocean Center, a lot of water, a little bit of pollution compared to the other sources in the harbor. So we started, you know, we had this hot spot thing that keeps showing up. So we started wondering, what is going on with stormwater? Um, we've estimated, based on, you know, literature and other observations, 14 to 20 events per year. I think Tapani's counted more than that. Um, and I recently, and I'll have to do a whole other talk on this, but I recently used some automated stormwater sampling equipment that's fairly sophisticated and it measures flow and it takes samples during the storm event at different intervals. So we can find out, you know, is most of the sediment coming at the beginning, at the end, in the middle, and that's important to know for pollution control. So we actually measured on February 6th a discharge of 20 million gallons in five hours, all through that one 40-inch culvert. Although I should say, there's ample evidence that it didn't all go through the culvert, that the water actually came over the road and flowed down the boat ramp into the harbor. 
And uh, at first I thought, like my instrument, uh, we lost part of our instrument because it just blew it right out of the culvert. Um, so at first when I saw the data and I saw how high the level was above the bottom of the culvert, I was like, well, that's wrong, you know, because it's, it's only 10 feet deep and it's showing, you know, like 12 feet. So when I look at the, the data, I thought my instrument was wrong. And, and then I, but I was like, or the water flooded over the road. And I, I saw some evidence of that, which is really hard in these fast draining, flashy watersheds to even find evidence of what's happened after the fact. Because um, it moves so fast, it doesn't always drop the sediment. So you can't really, sometimes that culvert is spotlessly clean. Um, <laughs> And especially after a big event, but the harbor is not so clean because the culvert is designed to get the water out of there. Um, so we saw significant, and when I say significant, I mean numbers that are so huge that we're afraid to tell you because we want to go confirm them all because they're like huge, 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 many, many, many tons of sediment in that five hours went into the harbor and out into the bay. Um, and it was evident to a lot of people. I've seen video actually online of the flooding part mm -hmm. and uh, also seen the discharge that was going on near the condos, that way, near the condos um, that had quite, you know, there's a flood basin there that's supposed to trap the sediment, but it, it was undersized for this type of storm. Yeah. Um, so, what we saw, I'm going to show you what that data looks like on a heat map, is that the Maui Ocean Center effluent is actually, you know, a force for good water quality in the harbor. And it serves kind of as a buffer for all of these intense um, events that are happening. It's also important to note that when all that surface water is moving, so is all that groundwater. So, so is injection well uh, effluent. Uh, any cesspools, contaminated ag, groundwater, any of that, that's all moving too. So the harbor is cleaner and um, water quality is better off because the ocean center is here. So, but you know, there's only so much you can do with 1.2 million gallons a day. And this is what the harbor looked like after that storm event. And again, even with the ocean center discharge still down here, there is so much pollution coming in here that there's no green here. So still lighter over here, but we found a new hot spot out of this data because what's right over here, injection wells and groundwater moving. Um, that may have ag contaminants. So we suspected this from things we read in the EIS about what they originally found there and from the very limited one or two pieces of data that we had previously. But looking at it after a storm event, those other ones must have been taken in dry weather. This one was taken in wet weather when the water was in. So, um, and we, I was just going to say that, look, Bobby, I've made a bubble pop up. <laughs> that we know that this is storm water or, or groundwater because it's fresh. Um, you, can, you can see the low salinities in the areas where this fresh water is. You're very proud of this bubble. You were proud of the bubble. Okay, so um, just to compare, this is how it is during dry weather, this is how it is during wet weather. So um, another interesting thing, because I was the one out at all the crazy hours out in the storms, is that the water, it's a pulsed flow. It, it's almost like a heartbeat. And that drain is so well designed. I got a great appreciation of civil engineering watching that thing, because it almost sucks the water off the mountain. So good thing for drainage, poor thing for water quality. And so there's the challenges. So what are we going to do about this? You know, this is like Tapani said, you know, this is not something that Maui Ocean Center can solve by reducing their 2% of the dry weather load. We don't, we haven't even calculated what it is of the wet weather load. But they're a tiny, manini pollutant load 
they're a big uh, cleaner seawater discharge but even that isn't going to solve this problem. We have to stop some of that sediment from coming in, um, and we have to figure out what's going on here. So, very big problem, and as the DOH suggested, it really requires a consortium. It's a community effort, and EPA gives a lot of guidance on how to plan to manage the land so that it doesn't pollute the water. It's called watershed planning. And uh, the Central Maui Soil and Water Conservation District has decided to write a Mayalaya Harbor, uh, well, really a Mayalaya 50,000 acre watershed plan. So it'll, it'll protect the harbor and the bay. Um, of course, Maui Ocean Center is very interested in the harbor part, as should be any other businesses that um, operate out of there, as should be any tourist uh, or, or uh, hospitality business as should anyone who wants to fish there or to go out on a boat there. Um, we all have an interest in this water quality in this harbor. Um, and water quality is a big part of our economy, and I think that that is a really important thing for people to get. That, you know, caveat and I are a very rare uh, breed in Hawaii. Hawaii does not have many actual environmental scientists or environmental engineers. They don't even register environmental engineers. So environmental professionals have integrated disciplines. They integrate law, engineering, and science. And that's what's needed to solve this problem. So I hope in the watershed planning that you all will come and learn more about that process. And I also hope that it will provide some opportunities for some of our you know, recent graduates in the sustainability program or the marine option program. Um, Jessica, are you here? Yeah, hi. Come up and say hi. This is um, one of the things that's exciting to me is to be able to bring up young professionals in the environmental profession. So this is Jessica, and she's the one that you know goes out and gets all the houses and She has um, recently graduated. Was it Washington State? Uh, Central Washington. Central Washington yeah. University with a degree in biology. And so she is an environmental scientist in training. And we're really happy to have her on the team. Thanks. <laughs> so. Oh, we had more slides. Thanks, Avia. Um, so ammonia, same pattern, very red, uh, cleaner in the middle where the ocean center discharge is. Regular conditions, lots of green under dry weather conditions, again due to the ocean center discharge. Um, TSS, of course, was the most significant pollutant that came in in that storm. Total suspended solids, that's your actual sediment. Um, and then this one, interesting. This was so muddy over here, and we can't figure out why. We don't know of a direct um, discharge of sediment, but that's the kind of things you investigate with the watershed. and phosphate, similar patterns. So currently the harbor is cleaner because of the Maui Ocean Center activities, but it is the entry point of major nutrient and sediment loads. And for the sake of the bay, as well as the recreational um, activity that is based at the harbor, uh, we really need a watershed plan. And Again, you're invited to join this watershed group, this consortia. We're trying to get the county on in a big way as a stakeholder, as well as State Department of Transportation. So you people have a lot of influence. So um, you know you can, uh, as we get this going, you can write to your government officials and encourage them to participate.